We can have hope this morning because God is working among his people. God cares about each one of us. And we can know today that each one of us is important and vital to carrying out the mission of God. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And you know, I, I'm, I'm excited because I already have heard some cool stories about family groups. And hey, if you uh, were in a family group this morning, you know, and you've studied this, you've studied some of what we're going to talk about today. And we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit deeper, a little different way about the same idea. But I know that ministry is going on. Ministry went on all during the week. People were caring for each other. The equipping was already happening. And you know, it's awesome to be a part of a, of a community where love happens, but where love happens in the name of Christ. And as I was getting ready for this, and, and you know, we've, we've been talking about our values, and, and I wanted to, you know, kind of bring our focus in with, with an illustration, because you're supposed to do that. You know, you're supposed to start off with something. I would start off with a joke, but I won't. I'll save that. That was it. See what I did there? <clears throat> but sports is on our minds right now. The Olympics, all the cool stuff. I, I think Winter Olympics are awesome. It's just amazing. I don't do any of that stuff, but it, it's, it's, it's really good. A couple of weeks ago, we had the Super Bowl. Now, some of us are still in therapy over last year. So I wasn't sure if this, it might be too soon, Counselor. I'm not sure uh, too soon to mention. But, you know, it was two teams that we sort of didn't have to care about, you know, unless you're from Boston or Philadelphia. Yeah, that's what I figured. There's, there's always somebody here. You know, <clears throat> I decided to, to be interested in the Eagles only because they're green. My high school colors were green and white. So I decided that's close enough. I have no idea about either one of these teams. So I just said, I'm, I'm going I'm to root for the Eagles. I, I figured they were going to lose. You know, I hate to say this, Georgia fans, you know, I, I kind of knew what was going to happen at the end of the season. You know, I don't know. I, I was excited about the Rose Bowl. I was ready just to turn the lights out on the whole season then. I knew we had to play Alabama. And I knew that the Eagles had to play the Patriots. And, you know, as I got to watching the game, I was like, it, it, about the same thing was going to happen. And, and, and I began to learn a few things about the Eagles. It was interesting how the media talked about Nick Foles. <clears throat> you know, when this other guy, Wentz, got hurt, they, they talked about Nick like he had never played football before. You know, it was really weird. It was like, oh, we're not sure if this guy knows what football is and uh, which, which direction to hold the ball, to throw it. Or it, it, it was really strange how they were talking about this poor guy. But I learned a little bit about the Eagles during the game, but I learned a whole lot more about the Eagles after the game. Yeah, I learned a whole lot about the Eagles this week because I, I wanted to find out if it was true. I had all my sports buddies, Don and a whole bunch of other folks, I was sending them this information that I got from the article. I said, is this true? Because I heard about uh, Nick Foles and, and Carson Wentz and, and Nate Sudfeld and, and there's an offensive coordinator named Frank Reich. And this was written about in the paper. And this journalist in, in the secular news in Philadelphia said this about these guys. They're all sincere men of God. They walk the walk. The, the quarterback, Sudfeld, said about his, his other two quarterbacks, they said, they are who you think they are. Now, this is in the secular paper. This is awesome. And then I read this quote by the offensive coordinator. Coach Reich said this. When he's talking about their devotion and, and they, how they care for each other and how they build each other up, he said this, I think all this helps you be a better teammate. Our primary calling in life as a Christian is to bring out the best in other people. That's the primary message of Christianity. We've been created to glorify God. How do we do that? He gives us gifts and abilities and we're supposed to bring out those, bring those out in other people. We're supposed to bring out the best in other people. We're supposed to glorify God. We're supposed to use our gifts. We're supposed to come alongside each other. And we're supposed to help each other prosper. He preached Ephesians in the Philadelphia newspaper. So good for him. Yeah, good for Coach Wright. He did it. And I, as I kept reading, I was looking, what are these guys doing? I heard that they, these, these, you know, they should be in competition. You know, you've got the, the, what they call the franchise quarterback, 
I don't know what that means, but the franchise quarterback, then you got the backup quarterback, and then you get the guy that's not ever sure he's going to play, but then that one time he does play, his uniform's all clean and pressed, and he looks scared. That's the third string guy, I'm, I'm not sure. And then, then the offensive coordinator guy, and, and plus some other guys on the team. But they meet before their team meetings. They, they sometimes gather after. It, this was all in the newspaper. They send each other encouragement, text messages. They pray for each other. You see, what I suspect and what it sounds like is these guys know it's not about football. They, f- they figured out something. These are authentic men working together for a cause greater than themselves. They know, but they also know that doing this makes me a better teammate. And I'm like, wow, this is really awesome to learn about these guys. And we all want to be part of a team like that. And New Hope, I want to tell you this morning, have hope. You are a part, not of a team, but a family, a community that is like that. I see it happening all the time, and as we begin to talk about this next value, equip each one to contribute, I want to paint a picture for you. It's, it's Ephesians 4.16 in, in the Living Bible paraphrase, but listen to this. Under his direction, the whole body is fitted together perfectly, and each part in its own special way helps all the other parts so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's awesome. That's really awesome. And it can be awesome because even in the actual translation, it says the same thing. It sounds great. We can do this when we experience what it takes to get us to Ephesians 4.16. And this morning, we're going to talk about equipping each one to contribute so that we can transform lives, transform families, transform communities. How? Through the revived people of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad we didn't just say transform lives, families, and communities, work harder, everybody? Because so, I'm not going to do it. But I can do it as a revived person of Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit. And we're going to talk, excuse me, we're going to talk about five things this morning. Five things that you can do to live out this value. Over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about elevate prayer, worship, and the word. We've talked about expect many to respond to Christ. And I just want to interject here that I think sometimes we get beaten down a little bit and we stop expecting people to respond to Christ. Please don't ever stop expecting people to respond to Christ. Go ahead and share that compassionate word. Go ahead and do that thing. Go ahead and step into your opportunity expectantly, evangelism and and compassion and doing good in Christ's name to lead people to Christ as a team sport. Because you may get the ball rolling, but somebody else, somebody else may may pick it up. Okay? So let's don't, let's don't get bogged down in that because sometimes that one, maybe that's me and thank you for letting me share that. But elevate prayer, worship in the word, expect many to respond to Christ, enable each person and family to grow and today equip each one to contribute. So if you get, get your Bibles out, uh, Ephesians or turn them on or click over to Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, listen to this. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for what you have done for us. 
Think that, that, that you never stop doing it. You saved us, but now you're filling us, and now you're equipping us. And Father, you're, you're, we are in your presence, Father, and, and that we can do great things in your name because of that presence of you in our lives. Thank you, Father, that we don't have to measure up. Thank you, Father, that we don't have to be perfect before we can serve you. That, Father, that you don't see us how we are, but you see us how we are in you. And we thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we're all gifted. Thank you that you've sent us people to equip us. Father, thank you that you fill us and you stand beside us as we do the ministry that you've called us to. Thank you that you have called your people together and you push us forward to build each other up in Christ. Thank you, Father, that you want us to be unified. Thank you that you want us to be mature. Thank you that we can speak truth and love and that we, in Christ, can be a healthy, growing community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So what we're going to do today, it's going to be fun. So for the next couple hours, we're going to walk through how some things that we can do to live out the value, equip each one to contribute. Now, there's a tricky section right before Ephesians 4.11. And if you were studying this week for your family group lesson, you may have seen it. You know, thank goodness for the equippers that have come into my life so that I can understand that better. I mean, it starts out with something and Jesus was ascending and then he was descending and then, then they throw in Psalm 68 and then we got all this stuff and it's about grace and something. You know, and I studied and I studied and I looked and finally one guy said, man, it's about gifts. It's about Jesus loved you and he gifted you and he filled you. The ascended Christ has filled us and works to gift us. So one of the first things we can do when we look at, at this background information in Ephesians 4, 7 to 10, the first thing we can do to, to be and live out equipping each one to contribute, number one is delight in the truth that God has gifted you. Ephesians 4, 7 to 10 basically says, you can delight that if you're a follower of Christ, you have been gifted by the ascended Christ. Amen. Amen. You've been gifted. You've been gifted. The next time you think, I don't have anything to offer, you say, am I a child of God? You say, yep. Then you do, because you've been gifted. The next time somebody tells you, you don't, you, you, you don't have anything to offer here, you can say, no, I do have something to offer because I've been gifted by the risen, ascended Christ. I have been given something in his or, or ordained purpose, perfect will, and the amount that I have been given was his idea. And 1 Corinthians says that I didn't choose it, he gave it. Amen. Have you ever gotten a gift? I don't want to stop there because that would be really sad if you had never gotten a gift. How many people have never gotten a gift? Because we're going to write your name now or I'll send you something. You got to keep going. That's why punctuation is important. Have you ever gotten a gift that you didn't do anything for? It wasn't a thank you gift. It, it maybe wasn't even a birthday gift or, or a Christmas. It was just a gift that just showed up. You didn't ask for it. it just, it, you know, and somebody especially picked something out just for you and sent it to you. That's, that's, it, it's a special, interesting feeling when that happens. But how much more then can we say that God in the beginning before time when he was considering all that he was going to do, the ascended Christ gifted us. That's a lot. We could kind of stop right now and go home because that's pretty awesome. I say awesome all the time, but that really is awesome. That the ascended, risen Christ, the Savior, the, the only hope for humanity, gifted me. Yeah, thank you. We've all been given gifts, but there's an expectation about this gift, is that we use it. And you know, 1 Corinthians tells us about the analogy, and if you've grown up in church, you've heard about spiritual gifts, and you've, you've heard about all this stuff around the giftedness, and you've heard it compared to the body, that's the way the Bible talks about it. 
uh, there's a Bible teacher called Warren Wearsby, and he says, a spiritual gift is a God-given ability to serve God and other Christians in such a way that Christ is glorified and believers are edified. That's pretty cool. But the body analogy is important. The body analogy is important because if there's any part of your body that's broken or isn't working or is mad and is pouting and won't participate with the rest of the body, apparently that's what happens when you get older. You get parts of your body that starts pouting and doesn't work right and you have to go to the doctor and they have to, you know, whatever. I'm going to tell you more than you want to know about me right now. I'm a cyclist. I like to ride a bike. Uh, you know, endurance sports, you have to eat and drink while you, you do the sport. Well, I tried golf for a while, and I was riding around in the golf cart, and I was eating chili dogs and eating french fries, and I said, this is an awesome sport, but I don't think it's going to help. <clears throat> That's not what I mean. You have to drink and, and drink, you know, stuff that you put in the bottle, and then you have to eat your stuff. You know, if I don't drink enough fluid while I'm riding a bike, my left foot cramps. Now, let me tell you about my left foot. It's the second toe on my left foot, if, if, and it does this. It gets kind of a right angle. And it kind of points in a weird direction, and it hurts. My whole rest of my body is totally focused on the second toe on my left foot. It doesn't matter how smart I am, how cute I am, how good my arms are working, how good my knees are working. It doesn't matter. My whole body is like, what is the matter with that guy? It just stops working. And you know what? In the body of Christ, if one of us gets wonky... How's that? Wonky. I threw that in. That's, that's, that's me speaking English. When it, gets, when it gets weird and my foot cramps and my toe doesn't work, the whole body is affected. So first of all, I want to say delight in your giftedness. Receive that giftedness and know that you matter and know that, that it all matters to the rest of us. Not how hard you work. Not how good you are but that you receive that gift and you use it because we're all dependent on you. Because if there's one person in here that thinks they don't measure up, if there's one person in here that, that thinks that, that, oh, I have nothing to offer, if you're a child of God, yes, you do. And I want to encourage you today that we're here to help you find your gift. You can know your gift. There's ways to know your gift. One way is to just start doing stuff. Just start doing stuff. And, and you start to see blessing in certain things. You can volunteer. I, I've got something that I want to show you. You can also go to a class. We have a class called Who Me? And it's, it's dedicated to helping you figure this out. I've given you a card today. Now, I know for some people, giving your name and email address to a Baptist church. By the way, this is a Baptist church. You've heard about us on the news. And it's awesome. Because, yeah, we really believe all this stuff. But you know what? You could check a box here. Who Me? So if this sounds good to you, you want to discover your gift, check who, me, and give us your name and email address. We're going to tell you how to get, give the cards back at the end. But there may be some other things that you want to check on here. And we're going to give you some information because we're sold out to the fact that we want to equip you to contribute. And we want to help you find out your giftedness. We want to help you discover that. But you can start serving. There's another way. You can get in community. When we're in community, we just sort of naturally start helping each other figure out where we're supposed to be. We're not just talking about the upfront gifts. I was going to do a little thing where I had the sound guy turn off the volume and show that it's not just the upfront gifts that matter, but it's the behind the scenes. But I was afraid if they turned off the sound, they wouldn't turn it back on. And then just to show how important the behind the scenes gifts are. I was going to say, you know, nobody knows what a gallbladder is in the body, but it must be important, so be a gallbladder. But I didn't think that would have the same impact. <laughs> Aren't you glad I don't use everything that I come up with? <laughs> yeah, amen. But the first thing is delight. Delight in the giftedness that God himself has ordained that you have. That is really, really powerful. I'm kind of overwhelmed with that. And I want you to delight in the gift that God has given to you. The second thing we can do to realize our value is we can depend on God-given equippers who can help you develop your gifts. Verse 11 right there says, It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. 
One thing I, I love about the Olympics is the perfection, that the level at which these athletes are performing at. I mean, they've even got a thing now where the guys ski backwards and they go over these bumps backwards. It was like, we couldn't, we couldn't do it enough forward. So now we got these guys. Have you seen it? I don't know what it's called. I, I thought I was turning the DVR tape backwards because they were ski. They were literally, these guys are skiing backwards. These guys are awesome. And then there's these people on a, on a sled that's about as big as this piece of paper. It's called a skeleton. First of all, I'm not riding a sled that's called a skeleton. That, that can't be good. And they're going down this water slide of ice at 80 miles an hour. But I'll tell you one thing about, about the skaters, the skiers, the whatevers. Even though that they're at the pinnacle of their ability, they still have what? They still have a coach. They still got a coach. And, and right here this verse says, God gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists. And I'm not going to get us all bogged down. And is it, you know, do we still have apostles and prophets? And do, is that pastor teachers at two things or is it one thing? We're not going to get bogged down in that. We're going to look at this and say God has ordained leaders in the church to come alongside us. They may not gift us. They may not give us the gift because we've already established that was God. But they're here to resource us and to share wisdom with us and to sharpen us and to move us forward. You know the Greek word right there, the equip, it means perfect. So God has raised up anointed people to help you be perfected for a purpose. So we want to honor those positions. But the cool thing is, is we as Baptists, we believe in something called the priesthood of the believer and that we're all kind of expected to move forward into maturity to be able to do that too. So God has raised up some people already, but he's still raising up people already to be coaches and equippers. So that's the cool thing. So we can all use some coaching. We can all use some coaching. And one of the things that I know about, about learning, you know, it's head, it's heart, and it's hands. That's kind of how you kind of break down learning. We, we learn things with our minds, and it changes our heart, and it changes our behavior. Sometimes we go do things, and it changes our heart, and then it changes our minds. But that's the way we learn. And the head, heart, hands, as we practice letting, letting God work in our mind, letting God work through our heart, letting God change our behavior, it creates, doing this over and over creates habit. And we can have the habits of Christ. We call it Christ-likeness. It's talked about in Ephesians 5. But there are other ways to be equipped. But I do want to say that we don't believe that discipleship is a class you take or an event you go to or a seminar that you sign up for or just a book you've read. Yeah, we believe those are tools for discipleship, but discipleship is a process. It's a process. It's a whole life process. You, you take the courses. You do the things. You come together, but there's also other ways. You practice what you've learned. Sometimes the distance between knowing something and not knowing is far less than the distance between knowing and doing. We know a lot of stuff that we don't do. And we need to come alongside and help each other. A guy wrote back in about 1600, his name was Richard Baxter. He said, Lord, let my heart be as orthodox as my head. I love that. But we believe it's a process. You can step into service. You can ask people. You can get involved in your family group. A couple of things you can check on your box. If you're not in a family group, get in a family group. Really, really. Get, get in one. And because you'll, you'll become a community and you'll help each other get better at what God has called you to do. And you'll be using your gifts and it'll be awesome. You can go on a mission trip. You can get involved in the choir. There's stuff. you can, Hey, we even got an other box. If you just make up something you want to try, just write it on there and turn the card in. And then you'll be in charge of the made up stuff. See, that's how it works. That's how it works. You might be living out love and compassion in your neighborhood. Or to a family member. That's equipping too. The cool thing about equipping is, is we don't have to be perfect to be equipped. That would be like saying you can't start a weight loss program until you're fit. You can't exercise until you're in shape. You can't go to college until you're smart. That's not how it works. God says, I've gifted you. Step into it. 
There's one way that we equip, and I want to park out for just a second. That sometimes the discipleship guy, you know, will say, yeah, well, we've got that big event, but that's just to gather people together for my group ministry. You know, it's really just, hey, pastor, get a big group in there so, so I have more people in my family groups or I, I have a bigger audience to get people. No, this is part of the equipping process. This room, in this very room, is a huge piece of the equipping process. See, we don't just, just have this event to see how many people we can get in this big old room. We think it's important. Because during the worship part, that's so amazing every week. And I gotta, I'm going to start wearing a scarf. It's going to be cool. Like Brent. It's good. I like that scarf, man. That's good. But... That's not what you're supposed to think about during the worship part, by the way. You're supposed to think about what's actually happening on the platform. Kind of like now, I'm sort of drifting off. I'm preaching, but I'm, I'm like not paying attention anymore. <laughs> what time is it? No. Um, <clears throat> listen, we get everybody in the room to worship together. To worship together. I love this room because we can see each other. Because when we come together to worship together, we realize that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. As hard as I try, I can't be 1,200 people. And it's so cool. I look over here. Sometimes I, I just watch and let the anointing of the people of God pour over me. That's part of the equipping process. Sometimes God speaks to me in ways that maybe the song's not even about some way that God is speaking to me. God is changing me. God is transforming me right in the middle of a, of a guitar solo. Yeah. Thank you. But that's why it's so important. And then we hear the message. Of course, the message, the message of the message is what we're supposed to be hearing, but doesn't God sometimes inspire your heart, inspire your mind to write down something that seems to be completely different? And God is speaking to you. God is speaking to us right now. That's why we want people to come to worship. That's why we say it's important. To go Start vacation at 1.30. Don't miss out the gathering of God's people because God inhabits the praise of his people and he has something to say to us and he has something to say to you. So don't miss it because this is awesome and this is a privilege. And I just wanted to say that because I think what we have is very, very special and very, very needed. The important lesson that's taught here is not only do we have apostles and prophets and evangelists and people who can equip us, but the entire church is engaged in the equipping process and in spiritual activity. The universal priesthood of believers, we're all here for each other. So we've talked about a couple of things. And there's probably something that you need to check a box on right here. And we're going to get to the top two in just a second. But delight in the truth, depend on the equippers, and then discover your purpose. Now, the third thing that we can do to realize this value is discover your purpose for the kingdom. Now, let me read the verse. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. I googled the, word, the words, the phrase, having a purpose. Twelve and a half million hits on having a purpose. Everybody wants us to have a purpose. Got to have a purpose. Purpose, purpose, purpose. You got to have one. If you don't know it, you're a big old loser. Whatever. I don't know. It just, that's the way it seems. Here, this is a free career counseling seminar. If, if as we go through life and we're going to discover our purpose, that's very important. I think God, and we're going to talk about that. God has gifted us. God will give us a purpose. He'll give us a mission. He'll give us a calling. But be careful when you're creating your life purpose that you don't make it so small that you kind of can't do anything else because God sometimes surprises us and gets us to do something that, to use our giftedness in a way we never imagined. So if we say, I'm only going to do this, you know, I'm only going to be a left-handed wrench turner between one and two on Thursdays. I just made that up right then. But 
That's a little narrow. But if I say I'm going to be a guy who's going to come alongside and help people fix stuff, that broadens it. That was for free. Don't draw your, your career, your life too tightly. Let God move and to show you how your giftedness can be used into greater ways than you ever imagined. But discover your purpose for the church. The cool thing is our life in Christ gives us purpose. So even if you can't come up with your big, you know, purpose statement, your life in Christ gives you purpose. Your life in Christ gives you purpose. The second thing is we are equipped for a purpose. And I mentioned that earlier. But like every one of our gifts, we talk about this in Who Me, every gift, spiritual giftedness also many times has a corresponding function. For instance, if you're involved in a family group here at New Hope, we have a model called Shapes. Shapes. And, and it stands for like shepherd teacher. That's the teacher. So you might have a calling for that. You also may have a calling for administration of just organizing things. And it, you, you know you'll have that gift if you're sitting around going, man, we need to organize things. Okay, that, that might be pointing you to the right thing. But, you know, sometimes we need to take the burden of administration off the teacher. And there are people that have been called to do that. But then we have something called prayer and care. You may have hospitality gift. You may have a mercy gift. You may have other kinds of gifts. And you want to step into that. Evangelism. It's part of the shapes model, evangelism. We're all called to evangelize, but there are some people that can just read the phone book to somebody and they get saved. I don't know how it is. I have the gift of teaching and I can explain stuff for an hour and a half and we got Ken Friends over here. He's got the gift of evangelism. And all people want to say after I've talked to him for a couple hours is, can I talk to Ken, please? <laughs> and then shapes ends in S. You know, we like to throw parties at New Hope, and we need people to help us do that. But the point I'm making here is when, you're gifted, when your giftedness is in practice, even as something as simple as a family group, step into that. Don't be afraid to ask your shepherd, how can I help? How can I expand my giftedness? You can discover your purpose. It may be a word or phrase. It may be a problem in the world that just breaks your heart. Step into that. God is trying to show you something. Use, use yourself. Go ahead and discover your purpose and then decide to use, your last thing is decide to use your gifts to serve others. God is going to show you your gift. Let me go back and start back here and say delight in that truth and then depend on people to come alongside and be your coach. And then, then what we want you to do is press in to discover your giftedness, discover your purpose, your mission, your calling, your purpose. It doesn't matter. We're here to help you. But one thing I know for sure, if you'll ask God, he'll show you in his timing exactly what your purpose is. Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask some of us. Don't be afraid to ask people in your family group. And then the fourth one is that we have to decide to use our gifts to serve others. I don't know why. It is, but I don't need any help being selfish. I don't, I don't need any help being all about me. I don't need any help. There seems to be a gravitational pull toward me and my problems in my life, especially when we're driving. That three-second delay, really? The guy behind you is like, you pull out and he goes, and you're like, well, I didn't do anything. I mean, it's, we're all about us. We don't have to go to a class called how to be selfish. But we do need to make a decision. And it's interesting, I learned something about decisions. The stress that happens during the decision-making process, when we freeze, when we get afraid, when, when we shut down, it's during the process of trying to make the decision. There's less stress in having made a decision than there is trying to make one. So some of us are still waiting around to say, well, I don't know what I want to do in church. I don't, I don't know what it is. I got to wait till I'm perfect. Or I got I to wait. What? No, just step into it. Go ahead and decide right now that you are going to use your gift to serve others. Make the decision. Make the decision. 
It's just like music. It's just like athletics. You know, the more, the more in music, the more you practice your instrument, the more fun it is to play. You know, I, I, I could pick up a guitar. I know three chords and one little thing. And I'm done in about five minutes. But after that, it's not any fun anymore. If I could play like Jason or John or some of these guys, it'd be awesome just sit around and play. But you know, the more you do it, the more you enjoy it. It's like, it's like sports or athletics. The more you exercise, the more you practice your sport, the more you get in shape, the more fun it is to do the stuff, right? Well, God has given us a serve others muscle. And the more we do that, remember head, heart, hands, habits? The more we exercise the muscle of serving others, the more fun it gets, the easier it gets, the broader it becomes the more effect it has on others and on us. Let me give you a quick leadership seminar, servant leadership. Listen to this, Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Servant leadership is not leaders who serve. Servant leadership is servants who lead. Big difference. Let's be servants first. And then God will show us how to use those gifts for others. He'll show us how to to talk to our neighbors, how to talk to our family, how to serve out compassionately, how to do whatever it is God wants us to do. The the behind-the-scene things becomes like the most glorious thing we could ever do. That's awesome because now we're servants who are doing something, not doing something people who happen to be servants. It's a big difference. Servant leadership is not a type of leadership. It's a leadership worldview that I'm going to be a servant. I'm going to make a decision to be a servant. And that's what the fourth thing we do in order to realize our value. And then the last thing, the last thing that we can do to realize our value is dedicate your life for transformation. Dedicate your life for transformation. You see, if we, if we really are delighting in what God has given us and we really let people come around us and equip us and resource us and perfect us for God's purposes, if, if we then step in and realize our calling, our mission by, by serving Christ in everything we do and we decide to use that gift and we've made that decision, then we can dedicate our lives for transformation. We can dedicate our lives for transformation. It's it's a little bit like a formula right here in Ephesians 4. It's like giftedness plus equipping plus service equals body strengthened. Body means the body of Christ. So gifted plus equipping plus service equal body strengthened, resulting in, starting to sound like a math class, resulting in unity, maturity, and community. That's what the rest of the verse says. Listen to Ephesians 4, 13 to 16. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, wow, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, and each part does its work. That's the result. Three things. Unity. Unity. Maturity. And community. So the five things that we can do to live out this value of equipping each one to contribute are right there. 